verses 15 and 16, where we'll be today. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. He says, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Since that's not the end of the sentence there, we'll just go ahead and keep reading. But that will be our text. It will be verses 15 and 16. He goes on to write that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of His calling, and what the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of His power to us who believe according to the working of His mighty power, which He wrought in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and set Him at His own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power, and might and dominion, every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. My subject today, taken from verses 15 and 16, is thank God for other Christians. Thank God for other Christians. So you might say that this is a part of the series on Christians, or you might say this is part of the series on Ephesians. Either way it fits in, doesn't it? But Paul, as he's writing here to the church at Ephesus, he writes to them, and he says, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. And I love that, that he takes time in his letter to thank God for them. And today, you and I can do the same. We can thank God for other Christians, even if they are, as it were, several miles away, perhaps even a world away from us, separated because of distance, like these folks were from Paul, and he had to write the letter. You and I, we live in a world that's much different. The world has shrunk in ways because we have technology. I mean, Paul could have only dreamed that a mission work could be going on several thousand miles away and the missionary could pop on a video. You know, what in the world's that? Paul wouldn't have any clue. Show up on his phone. What is that? Paul wouldn't have a clue. Be live on Facebook? What is that? And Paul wouldn't have understood that. But we've been given those sorts of blessed, blessings and opportunity, and we rejoice when we can sit down at our, at our houses and places or even be on the go, and we can see, oh, look, Brother Samaru's working on his building. Here's, what's, here's an update. Here it comes, live. And... Oh, maybe I missed it. I didn't see it live, but I can watch the replay. How neat is that? We rejoice. You get a letter, an email, almost instantaneously from the Philippines like I did the other day. Or, you know, some folks still send letters reports and 
Brother Peter sends those sorts of things. And we, we rejoice to hear of other Christians. But how can we know who these Christians are? How can we know what other Christians are? Well, we notice something here. First of all, we notice that as Paul was thankful for them, there were things that he had heard about them. There were things he had heard about them. Understand that it's not that he was getting letters from them saying, hey, my name is David Green, I'm from Ephesus and I'm a Christian. You should thank God for me. That's not what he was getting from the church at Ephesus. He didn't say, he didn't say in this letter, after I received your letters telling me what good Christians you are, I thank God for it. He didn't, he didn't write that. That's not what was going on. But sometimes that's what happens, isn't it? Because people get on Facebook, they get on Instagram and all those sorts of things, and they, and they say, I'm proud to be a Christian. And, 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 and they, put, they put up the big signs and all that sort of thing. Sometimes even uh, whatever, whatever they're doing, they're, they're like bragging about it and that sort of thing. But that's not what was happening here. What was happening is that there were some things that Paul was hearing about that aligned with what Christians are supposed to be. And that's what we should pay attention to here in this text. And this goes along with what I was trying to say a couple Sundays ago in my message. And that is that not everyone and everything that says that they're a Christian is a Christian. Experience and history of the Lord's church proves that to be true. Some of the greatest enemies of the Lord's churches, go back and study the trail of blood, Look at the persecutions that have happened and then check to see where those persecutions came from. Guess where they came from? They came from other quote-unquote churches in the name of Christianity. Men who said that they were Christians killing Christians. You see what I'm, you see what I'm saying here? Are you following me? Do you understand that the people who were doing the killing, who were doing the imprisonment, thought, perhaps some of them, said that they were doing it in the name of Christ. The worst enemies of the Lord's churches weren't the pagans, weren't the Jews, weren't the Muslims. They were people and organizations that called themselves Christians. And so when we look at things and we say, all right, here's this group that says they're a Christian, here's this group that says they're a Christian, and especially when we look at them from history and we see what they've done and we see that they were at odds with one another and we see what was happening, we've got to ask ourselves, is Christianity divided? Is Christ divided? And the answer, of course, is no. And then we examine these things. Now, thankfully... God has not left us to our own opinions. He's given us His Word. Now, even with His Word, there's a lot of arguments that happen and a lot of disagreements that happen. We see that through the Internet. We see that through Facebook. We see, we see those sorts of things. But can you imagine if we didn't even have the Word of God and if it was left strictly to our opinions, what kind of things would happen? But we have, we have God's word, and where there's where there's chaos and confusion, 
or uncertainty on this. It's because of a neglect in God's Word. Over in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 13. 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Verse 5. Before we get into the meat and potatoes of our text here, I want us to consider this passage. 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 5, he says, Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not to your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobate. I read this to you, and in this message, because as I was studying this, this hit home to me. Before we can sit down and we examine anything and everything that calls itself a Christian, we need to examine our own selves. Because if we don't know our own selves, do we really know anything? Paul knew who he was. Paul knew where he was going. You see, I want us to know what it is to be a Christian. And yes, thank God for other Christians. But let us examine ourselves. In this, Charles Spurgeon had some things to say. I want to just uh, quote some of it here. He says, It is a who, he says, who does not understand that word examine? It is a scholastic idea. A teacher questions a student to see whether he has made any progress, whether he knows anything. It is a military idea. A captain on review day is not content with merely surveying the soldiers from a distance, but must look at all the combat gear. It is a legal idea. The lawyer examines or cross-examines the witness. It is a researcher's idea. A traveler who has to write a book about a country is not content merely to go around the borders, but goes through the whole country, climbs the hilltops, goes down into the deep valleys. There is another word. Examine yourselves. That means more than just self-examination. A person about to buy a house, sorry, to buy a horse, examines it. But after he has examined it, if he is prudent buyer, he says to the person from whom he is about to buy it, I must test this horse. There is more in testing than in examination. It is a deeper word and goes to the root and heart of the matter. A ship before it is launched is examined, but it is tested and tried before it is allowed to go out on long voyages. Why are we to test and examine ourselves to see if we're in the faith? Many a person's religion will stand examination, but will not stand proof. What good is ev everything a person knows if he does not know himself? We are to test and examine ourselves because it is a matter of the highest importance. Our soul, our own soul, our never dying soul is at risk. Will we risk that? We can afford to lose our bodies, but we cannot afford to have our souls cast into hell. We are to test and examine ourselves because we have only our time in this world to rectify our condition. If we are defeated in the battle of this life, we are defeated forever. We are to test and examine ourselves because many have been mistaken. The rock of presumption and the siren song of self-confidence entice many. Many have been lost and are wailing at their everlasting ruin. Their loss is to be traced to nothing more than that they never examined themselves to discover whether they were in the faith. We are to test and examine ourselves because God will examine us. God will not take His gold and silver by appearance. But each one of us must pass through a most searching test and scrutiny. We are to test and examine ourselves because if we are now in doubt, 
The speediest way to get rid of our doubts and fears is by self-examination. What if such a test should have a bad result? Better that we should find out now than to find out too late. So oh, how important it is, how important it is that we examine ourselves before we go out and try to examine everybody else. How important it is to be sure, to be sure, whether we be in the faith, to know that Jesus Christ is in you. And so when we look at this, we must look at this rightly. And so when we look at such a, 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 a sub subject, such an important passage like this, such an important examination, thank God. Thank God for Christians. Thank God. Thank God for this. But how do we know? Well, we begin where Paul begins. In Ephesians 1 and verse 15. Wherefore I also, Ephesians 1 and verse 15, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints. <coughs> that first, that first part, he says, I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus. This is where we must start. This is where true Christianity begins. Faith in the Lord Jesus. Faith in the Lord Jesus. It may be that a person is kind and moral, tender-hearted, loving. Oh, but we can't start there, can we? We better not start there, for there are many, many today who are in hell who were kind, moral, tender-hearted people. They died without Jesus. They died without Christ. And a moral, tender-hearted person, some folks may want that into Christianity, but a Christianity without Christ is no Christianity at all. Amen. It's important to notice, beloved, that he doesn't say here that I heard that I heard of your faith in God. Oh, he doesn't say that. Now, is it true that Christians believe in God? Yes, it is. Absolutely it's true. start there because as you go out of this world and you start talking to people and you start examining yourselves and you start examining other people and you talk to people who said you believe in God you'll find the Muslims believe in God the Jews believe in God Hindus believe in God You'll find, well, in James chapter 2, look at this. James chapter 2 and verse 19. In James 2 and verse 19, he says, Thou believest that there is one God. Thou doest well. Thou believest that there is one God. Thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. Folks, Satan himself today believes in God. But he's not, he's not a Christian there are folks today who come and they say, I believe in God. Oh, don't tell me your belief in God. Tell me of your faith in the Lord Jesus. Now, 
when I was up north, I used to have some dealings with a family, and they always used to talk about how much they love God. How much they love God. I pray for them because, folks, I pray that they love God, but I pray more that they love Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus. Amen. Our emphasis in our message <clears throat> needs to be the same message as the Bible's message, the same message as Paul's message. Over in the book of Acts chapter 4, Acts chapter 4, verses 10 through 12, look what it says here. Acts 4, verses 10 through 12, he says, Be it known unto you all, to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. When a man believes in Jesus, when a man or a woman professes faith in Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior, mark it well, he believes in God. And Jesus, or, or Paul, rather, Paul, when he when he writes here in our text, he doesn't go through systematically about the doctrine of the Trinity. He doesn't have to. He doesn't have to. You get the Lord Jesus right. The rest will be right. And let me just say, when you're first saved, you may not be able to explain the Trinity. And, 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 and I'll leave you in on a little secret. I can't explain the Trinity. How does one plus one plus one equal one? I'll tell you. I'll tell you, because God said so. And I know there have been some illustrations that have been used, like ice and liquid and, and, and uh, gas and, and that sort of thing. And I mean, those are, those are illust illustrations. They're all water, you know, and that sort of thing. But still, how can we, with human, term, human terms, Come up with, I mean, come up with the greatness of God. My point is, beware of Christianity with no Christ. There are even some churches today, the Universalists and those that talk about coming to God or believing in God, and you hear them on the radio. And if you're not careful, you'll miss their words, but pay attention to them because as preachers, we live or die by our words. Words mean something, and we must be careful. And I've heard men try to justify it, and they say, well, Jesus is God. Well, yes, that's true, but this isn't the biblical language. Folks are invited to Jesus Christ. Jesus himself said uh, in, in, in the book of John, <coughs> in, in uh,
in the passage. Um, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Um, anyway, I wrote, I wrote it down in the wrong passage, and I should know where that's at, but for some reason I'm drawing a blank. But you can't get to heaven except through Jesus. In the book of Hebrews chapter 12, Hebrews chapter 12 and verses 1 and 2, <clears throat> Scripture says this, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. We see Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. Notice he uses, the in our text, he uses the word Lord Jesus. That's no accident. He says, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, he could have said Jesus Christ. He could have said, he could have said Jesus, but he said the Lord Jesus. To trust him as Lord and Savior is to trust him completely, entirely, absolutely. This is the mark of a true believer. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 3. <coughs> 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 3. Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. You see, there's a lot of religions out there who will say that Jesus was a great teacher, great man. Even some that will say He was a great God. But not that he was the Lord. Not that he was God. Not that he is God, you see. And so understand, beloved, that the natural man does not want him as Lord. But when the Spirit of God gets a hold of a person, and if you're saved today, he got a hold of you, and you see him not just as Jesus, the mighty teacher. Not just as Jesus, the great God. Not even as just Jesus, the Savior, but Jesus, Lord and Savior. That's the difference. The Holy Spirit got a hold of you. He got a hold of me. Because the natural man wants a Savior, a God, a little G God, who is big enough to take care of the problem that we have when we need him. But other than that, we put him in our pocket. You know, out of sight, out of mind. Big enough for Sunday morning, and that's it. For some people, big enough for Easter and Christmas, and that's all. You know, that, that, that's sort of God. That's sort of a Jesus. Oh, but he's more than that to the child of God, folks. He's more than that. And this is what I identified. That's how Paul knew that these folks were genuine Christians because of their faith in the Lord Jesus. Now, I, I know there's some naysayers out there that said, well, why did Paul have to hear about this? Wasn't he, he involved in, the, in this work to begin with? Well, first of all, I believe he heard about it because, number one, he had left from Ephesus. And, uh, and, 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 and guess what? When, when you leave from a place and you go on 
somewhere else, true Christianity is going to continue, right? So you believe in Jesus, and think back to the day when you first trusted in Him. Guess what? Your faith has continued. That's a mark. You know, don't come at me and tell me, well, I'm, I know I'm a true Christian because I believed in Him back sometime in 1945. Tell me about how you still believe in Him, trust in Him today as your Lord and Savior. It's a continuing faith. Paul still heard about that. And guess what else? Guess what else? That church, after he left, would have had some other converts, right? There would have been some other folks. Because when you leave a church, and I've experienced this, and I'm sure you have too, maybe not in the same sense that Paul did, but whenever you leave a church, maybe you visited a church, and then come back some several years later, there's some familiar faces there, but there's usually, most always, some new faces. Praise the Lord. God's still in the saving business. And He says, I hear about that. I hear about that. There in Ephesians chapter 1, I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus. And I'm thankful. I'm thankful. But that's not all. Because there was a second mark. The second aspect to this. There in Ephesians 1 and verse 15, I, I want us to not miss this. And he says, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, and love unto all the saints. Love unto all the saints. Paul heard of their faith in the Lord Jesus and their love for all the saints. This is a mark of a true Christian because guess what? If you've been saved very long at all, you know. And you know, you know all about the natural man because you, you've been one. <laughs> you know the natural man don't want nothing to do with Christians. Why, you'd rather the natural man would rather be with anyone else except for a Christian. The natural man is not thankful for Christians, does not love Christians, and wants to rid the world of Christians. Let me tell you something. We may not be going through a bloodbath like the churches before us, but there are elements in this world, I am convinced, even in this country now, that are at work scheming to, to try to get rid of us, to silence us, to get us out of the school systems, the court systems, communities, and whatever. To get us out of homes. The non-Christian does not have anything in common with the Christian and so does not Enjoy being around them. Amos 3 and verse 3 says, Can two walk together except they be agreed? So sometimes the phrase is, Birds of a feather walk together. So examine yourselves. See if you're in the faith. The person who does not enjoy being around Christian people well, that's not a good sign. That's not a good sign. Like attracts like. And the folks there at Ephesus, they love the saints, all the saints. That's important. Some saints, some saints are more lovable than others, right? And, 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 and again, I, I, I believe that the Holy Spirit uses words here on purpose. None of them are wasted. He said, he says here, that I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints. He didn't say, I heard, I heard that you really uh, love the one 
ones that are lovable. I heard that you really do well with those that are like you. Uh, he didn't say that. You know, some, some Christians are easier to get along with than others. I mean, you all know that. You all know that. I mean, I think I'm pretty good to get along with. But, but listen, there are some people, and you know that as well as I do, who are just tough to get along with. They're like hanging out with porcupines or something. I mean, uh, you know, they, they're just rough. But the reality is they're, they're, they're God's people. Some saints have got uh, something about them. They're just different than us. Uh, believe it or not, there are some saints that are that are Yankees. I, I mean, they, they're just they, they, they're they're from way up north and whatever. They got that funny accent and all that sort of thing. And you know, they say, "How in the world Can you be a Christian and be from New York City?" But it's true. There are Christians from New York and Boston and uh, Connecticut. And, I mean, you just go and, and, and you love them. Please don't talk so much, but you love them, right? <laughs> and that nasally kind of New York accent, but you know, hey, that's uh, why. Why do we love them? We love them because we're related. Because we're washed in the blood of the Lamb. Because we we have the same daddy, if you want to think of it that way. How is it that you can get someone from all the way around the world, from a different culture, a different place, a different background, and all that sort of thing, come and, and, and come to the United States, spend time in our home, and it'd be like that we've been friends forever. Because of our relationship and our bond in Jesus Christ. Right? Galatians chapter 3. Galatians 3 and verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek there's neither bond nor free, there's neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. There are some differences amongst us. And if we're under any other kind of a system, it might separate us. But all those divisions are broken in Christ. Because of what He did. Jew and Gentile. No more division. Rich man, poor man. No more division. Black and white. No more division. Yankee Confederate. No more division. There's a set of books, I love this, that I've, that I've got. I pieced this thing together. Whenever I heard about it, I said, i got to get this set of books. So Southern Baptists and Northern Baptists set on a quest to write a commentary <clears throat> on the New Testament. The war broke out. I'm talking about the war that Lincoln started to try to stop so Southern independence. This is an awful war. You all know that. <clears throat> the project the project wasn't completed. <clears throat> Some of these guys fought against each other because of the war, because of the way things went. And at the end of the war, guess what they did? They picked up the pieces and they got it published. Why? Because they were brothers. Because that's what they needed to do. And, uh, and, and, I, and I often look at that Look at that completed set. I think, man, that's, that's great stuff. Only through Christ can that be done. Amen. Only through Christ. We go through it now. We see these things they're trying to divide us on. Masks and no masks. Vaccinated and unvaccinated. I don't care about none of that. 
Here we are. Get a vaccine if you want. Don't get one. You know? Ask my opinion, I'll give it to you. And I'll give you some strong reasons for it. But look, come on in. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. Eat meat if you want, don't eat meat. That's kind of a New Testament thing, isn't it? Come and study it out. See how that worked. See what, see what the scriptures say about it. See how these things work together. This here in Ephesians. You see, in, 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 in Ephesians chapter 1, this test. Think of it like two sides to a coin. If I were trying to trick Isaiah, if I had a coin, it's rare. And I said, man, this is a rare coin. I want to keep it. I don't want to trick my son. So I'm going to make a, a, a copy of it. So I'm going to give him the copy. And so I get to work at trying to make a counterfeit of it. And I sit in my workshop and I work and I work and I only get one side of the coin done. I said, man, that's a lot of work. And now i got to do the second side and you know what, I'm, I don't have time for that. I'm just going to present to him this coin on one side. So maybe I put it in a display case and so that that one side is showing and I make it real pretty. I say, here I say, I got you this coin, this rare coin. It's only one side, but I'm not going to tell him it's only one side. Isaiah, being the clever fellow that he is, he's going to say, wow, Dad, that's great. And he's going to look at it, and he's going to immediately try to open it up so he can look at both sides of the coin. I'm so, whoa, 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 don't do that. Don't get that out. That's a rare coin. <laughs> if I was trying to trick him, you see. Counterfeit Christianity is like that. One side or the other of the coin is oftentimes what's shown. But we got to look at both sides of the coin here. James brought it out this way. So, so if we look at our text again in Ephesians 1, just so it's fresh in our mind here, in Ephesians chapter 1, in verse 15, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, that's one side of the coin, then on the other side, love unto all the saints. So watch this. In James chapter 2, in James chapter 2, Notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest, as we read a while ago, there is one God, that thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead. So you see, some folks will have that, that coin, and they'll have a date on it, and they'll say, well, I 
I walked the aisle, I came forward, I was baptized, I did this, I did that, on such and such a date, in such and such a church, in 1985 or whatever, and they've got a date, they've got a certificate, they've got whatever, and say, that proves I'm a Christian. Okay. What about the other side of the coin? What about the other side? I think it's great that you remember the date that you were saved, the date that you were baptized, the date that those things are important. But understand this, baptism won't save you. Walking down the aisle won't save you. Coming to the front of the church won't save you. Understand it's faith in the Lord Jesus that saves. And faith without works is dead. Without Christ, it cannot be true Christianity. But, but faith without works is merely intellectual belief. What's that mean? It means it's all up here. It's all up here. Anybody can recite words that they've heard. Do, 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 you, do, you, believe, do you believe in Jesus? Yes. Do you want to go to heaven? Yes. Who doesn't want to go to heaven? Right? And they repeat those words. Well, where's the evidence of it, you see? And these two tests of true Christianity aren't just suggestions. I want to leave you with this in 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. should believe on the name of his son Jesus Christ and love one another as he gave us commandment. Verse 24, he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him and he in him. Hereby we know that he abideth in us by the spirit which he hath given us. Praise God for other Christians. Let us thank the Lord for them. But not only thank God for them, but let us be like Paul in this text. We didn't even get to really go very far into that next verse, but look at what he says there in Ephesians 1 and verse 16. He says, Cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. So not only did he thank God for them, but he also prayed for them. We need one another's prayers, don't we? Oh, how we ought to pray for our, our other brothers and sisters, other Christians, near as well as far. Thank God for Christians. Thank God for those who are willing to, uh, to pray for us. And may we also pray for others as well.